All right, so welcome to a Hold Fast Baptist Church Soul Winning Seminar. So today, um, go ahead and turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 10. Uh, Romans chapter 10. What we're going to do today is we're going to go through um, the gospel presentation um, as we should present the gospel at this church. Um, hopefully, um, it'll sharpen us all and just make us um, better at presenting um, the gospel. What you need is a Bible and then, of course, the uh, soul winning um, verses reference sheet. Um, that you all should have at this point. If you need a pen or paper, um, just uh, raise your hand and someone will bring you a pen and paper if you want um, to take notes or anything like that. So um, what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to start where we end, okay? So we're, we're going to end where we start. So look at Romans chapter 10. Um, why have a seminar like this? Look at Romans chapter 10 and verse number uh, 14. The Bible says, How then shall they call on him and who they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of who they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So this is just kind of walking the process back um, to how somebody will actually hear the gospel. And the Bible here is kind of explaining why Jesus gave the Great Commission. It's saying, you know, God's word needs a preacher. Somebody needs God's, God to preach God's word to them. Now look at verse number 15. It says, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. That's talking about your feet, okay? That's talking about your feet if you go out soul winning and bringing the gospel to people. But notice, why have a seminar like this? Why do we have soul winning times throughout the week? Because the Bible says that soul winners should be sent. They should be sent by, you know, a church. There should be, basically it's saying, this is why every church should have, every church with the proper gospel should have a soul winning ministry that sends people out. And we will always have that here. So not only are you sent out here, you know, by, a, by an organized soul winning ministry, this is why you come here for soul winning. Um, we will pair you up. We will give you maps. We will give you all the resources that you need to go out soul winning um, because it's the responsibility of, of the church to send out soul winners okay so once you're sent you preach they hear they believe and they call and that's how we're that's what we're going to go through today so as the responsibility of a soul winning ministry want to make sure that the culture of this church is always to give a thorough presentation of the gospel this is god's word we use god's word god's power not our own when we go out there so we just want to go through uh, you know how to do that in the best way possible. What we're going to do is just go through the soul winning presentation. Um, I'm going to start with an introduction, how we actually approach the door, um, and then just talk about, you know, how we go out soul winning and how we go through the verses themselves. But basically, the methodology of soul winning is just going to be reading a verse as you have on your sheets and then explaining that verse. All right, so let's go ahead and just get started. All right, so Preparation for soul winning, all right? Obviously, you know, it's best for a soul winner to be right with God, to be prepared spiritually. You always want to be, you know, hopefully you're praying daily in your spiritual lives. You know, um, most people that aren't right spiritually aren't going to want to come soul winning, all right? But you want to come soul winning with the right attitude. You know, not like, I got to go soul winning today. Uh, but you want to come soul winning with the attitude of, you know, just having a heart towards people that are not saved. You know, you were saved and you didn't deserve to be saved, so God wants you to go tell other people how to be saved. So obviously you want to have the right heart towards the lost, okay? But for this church, we want to have, you know, what, what should you wear? What should, your, um, what should you look like when you go out soul winning? Um, obviously we want to be dressed appropriately when we go out soul winning. Um, you'll see me, if you're soul winning with me on Sunday, I'm always wearing a tie because I'm wearing a tie um, Sunday in church. I don't believe that um, it's necessary that you wear a tie out soul winning um, for the men, but basically, um, you know, business casual. If I wear a t-shirt on Saturdays, it'll usually be a Hold Fast Baptist Church t-shirt. The key thing to remember here, and then ladies, you know, you just need to be, you need to be dressed modestly. You need to be dressed like ladies. You just remember, when you're out there soul winning, you're a representation of Hold Fast Baptist Church, okay? So that's, um, that's that, all right? So that is the you know, how we should look, you know, we shouldn't be 
um, wearing ripped up clothes and, and you know, a t-shirt with MTV on it or, you know, I mean, just, it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, ladies, if you have any questions, just talk to my wife about, um, you know, how ladies should look out soul winning. Um, but basically we want to be, just always remember that we're a representation of this church. You're literally going out and, you know, representing Hold Fast Baptist Church, all right? So um, just keep that in mind. The structure, how do we, how do we soul win? We soul win, um, as the Bible says, we soul win in partners. You're never going to be out knocking doors by yourself. So if, if you're new to soul winning or you've not done much soul winning, you know, don't worry. You're always going to be partnered up with somebody. And if you're new to soul winning and you've never done it before, you could literally come soul winning with us and have and no clue what soul winning is about and you don't have to worry because what we would do is you would just, we have um, soul winners that go out and one of those soul winners is a silent partner and one is the talker, all right? This is how it's always structured. Every single time we go out soul winning, we partner people up, which is why it's just such a great, it's a great way to get to know your, your brothers and sisters in Christ in the church as well. Um, you just get to go out and visit with people as you're going out soul winning. Um, whether it's receptive or not, you at least get to fellowship with your your fellow, um, your fellow church members. So that is how it's structured. You will always go out in pairs, and there will be, as you go to doors, there will always be one talker and one silent partner. Now, if you've, you're not ready to talk yet, you will always be the silent partner, all right? But this is super important that you understand this structure because um, not everybody has this structure, but this is the structure that we will have here, all right? When you go to a door, I don't care if you're, you're both talkers and you're both able to give the gospel. When you go to a door, you will alternate being talkers. So the way we usually typically do it here, I um, usually work that out with your partner, but we always say knock till you talk. So if Brother Jeff and I go out soul winning as we did today, um, I'll knock on a door, and if nobody's home, I'll put an invite in the door, and then I'll go to the next door. I'll knock on the door, and then if somebody answers and I say hello, I literally speak to that person, then at the next door, no matter how that goes, at the next door, it's Jeff's turn to talk, all right? This is a great way to, to go soul winning, and what we never want to have happen is have two people talking at somebody at the door. And if you're an experienced soul winner and there's a less experienced soul winner at the door being the talker, it, but you're the silent partner, you be silent. That's, that's the key. The silent partner is to be silent. All right, now, that being said, let's say we have a new soul winner that goes out and they're just beginning to talk and they get tripped up or they get hung up on something. And in that case, it is okay for them to turn to the more experienced soul winner that is the silent partner at that point and just say, hey, brother Jeff, could you, you want to answer that question? But at that point, you become the silent partner. Okay, because why do we do it this way? The reason we do it this way is because what you'll find, and if you could just put yourself in this situation, we always want to remember that we're uninvited guests at somebody's door, number one, all right? That should be our attitude when we go to that door. And second of all, when there's two people talking at anybody, it's very easy for people to feel overwhelmed, to feel attacked, to feel, you know, maybe you're just jumping in, you have a better idea, or you think you have a better idea, or whatever. It's very easy to just overwhelm somebody. They feel like they're being ganged up on at their own door, all right? So we never want to do that, all right? We're all going to have, ideally, the same, you know, basic soul winning models. So when you're silent, you're silent. If you have to pass it over, which is fine. I did that. We all did that when we were starting out soul winning. Uh, maybe we, somebody asked a question we didn't know the answer to, just pass it off to, you know, brother whoever or sister so-and-so that is more experienced. There is nothing wrong with that at all. But at that point, you are now the silent partner. All right, so that's, that's the attire, that's the structure. How about, you know, our attitude? How about our attitude? Now, this is huge, okay? This is huge because, first of all, as I said, we're uninvited guests at somebody's door, all right? We are, we are not out there to, to, you know, force someone to believe. You can't do it. We're not out there to argue with people. We are not out there to debate with people of different religions, all right? We are looking for, Pastor Jimenez used to say it this way, we are looking for the right fish. We are looking for the people that are open to hear what the Bible has to say and that want to, you know, that want to be taught from the Bible. And look, 
when you get a little bit of experience, you will be able to recognize if somebody is willing to be taught and wants to hear what you have to say versus someone that wants to talk at you and debate with you. You'll be able to recognize that within just a few seconds of the conversation. All right. It's very easy um, to recognize that when you get a little bit of experience. So that's that. Just remember, we are, we are to be polite and we are uninvited guests. Okay. Nobody asked us to come there. We're uninvited guests. We're polite. We're on their property. Keep that in mind. The second thing is this on your attitude. It's been proven that people decide in their minds if they want to talk to you within the first few seconds of meeting you. Like, so when you come to the door, maybe you're not having a great day, maybe work was bad and you're soul winning on Wednesday or whatever, um, and you're just like, you know, hi, you know, we're from Hold Fast, but you know, look, people can tell. People can tell that. And just also, you have to kind of keep in mind as you become a soul winner for years and years and years and years that even though you may have given the gospel hundreds or thousands of times, you have to remember that this is that person's one chance. Maybe this is the only time that someone will actually come and want to preach the gospel to them in their lives. You were sent there to that person for a reason. So you have to make it new, make it exciting for yourself every single time. No matter what kind of day you're having, you might have to overcome you know, those negative feelings. Smile. You know, people can, you know, if, if you're in a good mood, you're smiling, People will want to talk to you. You know, if you're just like, you know, and, and you've had a bad day or whatever, and look, we all have bad days, but try to have a good attitude and be smiling and to, you know, have some energy in your voice and, you know, be, make them make that subconscious decision that this is a person I would like to hear more from. All right, because people make that, you can definitely be a better soul winner or that, you know, you can improve your soul winning just on how you speak to people, how you're interpersonally interacting with people for sure. Okay, so that's the, that's all just to say the preparation. Okay, that's the preparation for yourself, your attitude, um, what we're going to wear, all those things. All right, so let's talk about the introduction. The introduction, before we even get into, you know, the Bible verses, okay. We're going to have, um, these are what you're going to have when you go out soul winning uh, most of the time, unless we have a special, um, unless we have a special um, event or sermon series or something coming up. Most of the time you're going to go out with this invitation, okay? This invitation says Hold Fast Baptist Church, has the church service times on the back, and then of course um, it's got the QR code with the Bible Way to Heaven in both Spanish, in English and Spanish um, on the back, all right? So the first thing that you're going to do is you are going to go up to the door before we get into any Bible verses. You have to find out if this is someone that wants to hear, you know, how to get to heaven. So how do we do that? The first thing that we do is we go up to the door, we knock on the door. I'll kind of give you some examples of even how to knock on doors and doorbells and things like that in the example. But we're going to say, hi, we're from Hold Fast Baptist Church. All right, so we want to say the name of the church and we want to get the word Baptist out in that first sentence. That's important. Why is that important? Because there's Jehovah's Witnesses, there's Mormons, and it, many people actually don't know today that Baptists go out soul winning because so many Baptists have actually stopped soul winning. All right, so people, when they drive by and they see somebody out walking door to door, they're going to maybe assume you're a Jehovah's Witness. All right, so we want to say, all right, we're from Hold Fast Baptist Church. We're just out in your neighborhood inviting folks to church. Can you go to church anywhere? All right, so that's what we're going to ask. All right, we're going to ask, do you go to church anywhere? And then guess what? Stop and listen to them. All right, we don't really, we're not really interested that much in where they go to church, but we do want to remember that if you're going to be a good soul winner, this needs to be a conversation. All right, it needs to be a conversation that they're involved in. The better you get at involving people in the conversation, the more people that you will have stick with you and actually, you know, get saved. All right. So we're from Hold Fast Baptist Church. You know, we're out in your neighborhood inviting folks to church. Do you go to church anywhere? All right. And a lot of people today are going to say, no, I don't. Or they're going to say, yes, I go to, uh, you know, Saint whatever or so-and-so church or the table, the door, the ceiling fan, whatever it is. Okay. So they're going to either tell you where ch what church they go to or they're going to say they don't go to church. All right. Either way, we're going to follow that up with, oh, that's great. You know, we're not, and if somebody says a church, I always kind of mention like, hey, we're not out trying to steal people from their church. You know, wanna, don't want to offend people. So I'll say, we're not trying to steal people from your church. 
But this is really what we're getting at. We're trying to get to this question, okay? And we're going to say, you know, more important, though, than going to church is, you know, if you died today, do you know if you would go to heaven? You know, if you died today, God forbid, you know, do you know if you'd go to heaven? And then what you want to do is you make sure that you listen. Listen to what, and you know, you're pushing a, and you're going to push a record button in your mind, okay? Because they're going to say something to you 99% of the time, it's going to be something like, I don't know. And then if they say, I don't know, for example, then what you're going to say is, well, let me just say, what do you think it takes to get to heaven? Because everybody has some idea in their mind on, on what they're, you know, will give them a good chance of getting to heaven. All right. And then a good way to get the actual answer out of them is to say, say I was your friend and I asked you, how do I get to heaven? What would you tell me? And then again, listen and record. Just listen and try to remember what they tell you, all right? Because then if, you know, they tell you, well, be a good person, just try to follow the Bible, follow Jesus, some form of works-based salvation, you need to remember that because if you do get to preach the gospel to this person, this is what they need to change their mind about. This is what it means to repent, okay? This is what they need to change their mind about, and instead of trusting those things, they need to put their trust on Jesus, all right? In the case where they say that it's just believing in Jesus, okay, this is the Baptist that would come to my door before I was saved. So there's a little bit further into that. I'll, I'll come back to this one in just a minute. But in the case where they say, well, you know, believe in Jesus. Now, we need to follow that question up or that answer up with, do you think there's anything you could do once you're saved to where God would take away your salvation, all right? So what we're doing is we're, we're seeing if they really, you know, believe in just faith alone for salvation, all right? And a lot of times you'll find people, and this was my problem, right? Baptists would come to my door and they would say, you know, how do you get to heaven? I'd be like, oh, faith in Jesus, just believe in Jesus. But they never followed up with eternal security because I would have told them, of course you can lose it if you don't do X, Y, and Z. I knew the difference between the Lutherans and the Baptists, all right? So we want to follow that up with, is there anything you can do where God would take away your salvation? And then again, listen and record, okay? Listen and record. So you don't want to just be like rushing these questions one after another because people can actually tell when you don't really care what they say and you're just wanting to speak to them, right? And yet that is the case. We do want to show them the truth, but be open to listening what they're telling you and, and you know, show them that, you listen, that you're listening to them by letting them speak. I'm not talking about giving a 20-minute you know, lecture to you. You don't want to waste time. We'll talk about that um, towards the end. But listen to what they say because it's going to be important when you follow up with this final question. So the final question, whether they say you can lose your salvation, whether they say, you know, it's works-based in some way or another, is that just say this, well, the Bible says something a little bit different, you know, can I show you? I can show you in just a few minutes, in, you know, 15 minutes or 20 minutes, I can show you. A lot of people don't say a number. Um, I, w I usually just say I can show you in just a few minutes, uh, which, you know, but what you don't want to say is, I can show you in just like two minutes, because that's a lie. So you don't want to like come up, you know, say, it just, it'll just take me two minutes, and I can show you. But just say, the Bible says something different. I could show you straight from the Bible if you'd like to see, all right? So that's where you have to just listen to them, and this is going to be the answer, right? This is going to be the answer where they say, sure. You say, sure, you can show me. And then, or they're going to say, no, you know, I, I can't because I'm, I'm doing something. I don't have time right now. All right, which in, which in that case, you'll just point them um, nicely to the video on the back of the card, tell them to have a good day, God bless you, um, and move to the next door. What we're looking for is the person that says, sure, you can show me, All right? And at that point, we will go into giving the gospel. We are going to give the complete gospel presentation every time. All right, Jesus, when he went to the well, you know, he just went, basically was, all he had to do is tell this lady that he was the Messiah, and that was it, because, you know, Jesus is Jesus. Jesus is God. He already knows what people believe and what they don't. We are never going to give the two-minute gospel, the three-minute gospel, the four-minute gospel, where we go up and we think we make an assessment on, oh, they only need to be tuned up in this area. What we're going to do is we're always going to give the complete gospel presentation. 
all right? This is part of being a thorough ambassador um, of Christ, all right? So we're going to start out, we're basically going to say, like, all right, I'll show you everything. I'll pull out my Bible at this point, and I'll say, look, this is why, you know, you don't even have to have the verses memorized. I mean, you're going to get the verses memorized, trust me. But it's not even important because you're going to be reading the verses right to them, pointing them at the verses. You want to show them that the words that you are saying are in the Bible itself. Many times I'll have them complete the verses. You know, just what does that word say right there? Just to make sure that they're still engaged, okay? It's really important. And notice, what was the thing that I did when I started to get to the end where I thought that um, Garrett was going to let me give him the gospel? I asked what his name was, all right? This is another very important um, interpersonal skill right here. You don't ever start giving the gospel to somebody you don't even know their name, all right? Because their name is such a powerful thing, all right? Because when you say somebody's name, Jacob, and you say somebody's name, Ashley, what they do is they immediately look up and they, they look at you. It is a very powerful tool to keep people's attention, all right? It shows you that you're personally talking to them, all right? So we're starting to give the gospel. So what you say is, you know, I'm going to show you some things um, from the Bible. Um, there's a few things before I can show you where the Bible is different from what you told me. There's a few things that we need to understand first, all right? And then we're just going to start right in Romans chapter 3. And if you run into somebody that's been in church and that's Catholic, they're going, to, they're going to know these things at the beginning, right? They're going to know these things, um, but that's good because it kind of gives you um, a good relationship with them where they're agreeing with what you're saying. They're seeing, hey, the Bible says this and I agree with this. That's why I love how, you know, Romans chapter 3 starts off. We start with Romans 3.10, all right? The Bible says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one, all right? And then usually I'll ask them, right away I'll ask them, right away I'll be like, you see that word righteous there? You see that word righteous? You know, what does that mean to you? And then guess what? Listen to what they say. You, this is a conversation, right? We're doing the teaching, but we want them to be engaged in the conversation. And a lot of times, I would say 50% of the time, people will use the word perfect. They'll say, well, that means that you have to be perfect. And that's kind of what we're getting them, um, trying to lead them towards. And you can say, exactly. That means that nobody's perfect. You know, no, not one. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. All right, over here in Romans 3.23, the Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So the Bible here is saying that, you know, you're a sinner. So at this point, you're going to use their name again. You're going to say, you know, Garrett, so Garrett, you know, the Bible says that you've sinned, I've sinned. And I always ask this question. It's like, what is a sin? You know, because you never know what people think is a sin. And at that point, they'll tell you, you know, well, bad things, you know, doing bad things. And then I'll just relate them right back to, like, the Ten Commandments, because everyone has heard of the Ten Commandments. And I'll be like, yeah, exactly. Like, the Ten Commandments, you know, don't lie, don't steal, be good to your parents, all these things. And at that point, um, you know, you basically told them, and look, it is going to be extremely rare to find somebody that does not admit to you that they are a sinner. I think in, in, in years and years and years and years of soul winning, I, I've met just a handful of people that say, I don't sin. Okay, so this one, you are not going to have a problem here. People are going to tell you, you know, yeah, of course, of course we do bad things. Of course, you know, we've, we've done things wrong. So the Bible here is just saying that we've all sinned, we've all done things wrong. Basically, a sin, then I'll kind of take over back over from here, I'll say a sin is a transgression of the law. You know, it's like we have broken God's law. And is more than just the Ten Commandments, there's hundreds of commandments in the Bible. And if we're honest with ourselves, we know we've done more than just break one of those laws. So then I'll start, I'll, I'll lead them into Romans 6.23, and I'll say, look, the Bible, you know, says that, you know, God is love, but God is also a perfect judge. So what we need to understand is what we deserve for our sin. You know, what, that, what does that mean for us? That, that we are sinners, that we have broken God's law, all right? And then I'll give the first, um, I'll give the first analogy that I use soul winning um, during this phase right here. But then I'll read to them Romans, and I'll show you that in the example, but I'll read Romans 6.23, the first part of it. So you'll notice we have 6.23a and 6.23b in your soul winning verse, but we want to use the first part right now where the Bible says, the wages of sin is death, all right? So we're trying to get them to understand that what they deserve for their sin is death, all right? Now what we're going to do is we're going to explain hell, and we're going to explain 
what this, the wages of sin is death, that it's not just talking about a physical death. All right, this is where we're going to take them. If you look at your sheets, we're going to take them into Revelation chapter 20 and Revelation chapter 21. All right, so Revelation 20, 14. So you're going to say to them, you're going to say, look, um, that sounds pretty bad, right? I mean, the thing is, it's not just talking, Garrett, about a physical death. It's talking about a spiritual death or what the Bible calls a second death. All right. And now we're going to go and we're going to read um, Revelation verses to them. And what we're doing is explaining the concept and the place of hell to this person. All right. Now, let me just say this before we get into hell. This may be the most important part of the gospel presentation. Okay. Certainly to this point, because if you do a good job, if you do a good job explaining hell to somebody, you will have their attention for the rest of the whatever time you need. Because if you, can, if you can show people from the Bible that they literally deserve eternal torment, you are not going to have a problem with them paying attention to you for another 15 or 20 minutes for you to explain them how to get out of eternal torment. Does that make sense? So if you're gonna, you know, we don't wanna blast through any part of the gospel presentation but if you want to pay attention and be detailed and make sure they understand the gospel, this is super important, okay? Just getting them to understand the condition that they are in, all right? So we're going to go to Revelation 20, uh, 14 first, where the Bible says, so Garrett, I'm going to show you um, where the Bible talks about, you know, this second death. Over here in Revelation, Revelation 20, 14, the Bible says, in death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Right? Many times that's all I will read of that verse. Um, I won't read the second part, but if you want to, you can. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Um, you know, it brings up the book of life and some other things. I kind of have a philosophy, like I want people to understand the details of the gospel that they need to get saved. I'm not trying to overcomplicate things and like bring in a bunch of like doctrines that they don't need to get saved, that they can learn when they come to church and all these things, okay? So, you see how the Bible says right there, the second death. You see that, Garrett? Um, being cast into the lake of fire is the second death. And also, there's some, you know, there's some more complicated doctrine on the lake of fire and hell. They're actually not in the same place right now. But we're going to kind of bypass that as well because it's not important. So I'm going to say to the person at the door at that, that point, the lake of fire, Garrett, what does that sound like to you? And... 90% of the time, they're going to say it sounds like hell, okay? They're going to use that word hell, all right? And then what you want to equate for them, you're trying to get them to understand that the second death is being cast into hell, all right? And I'm going to explain to them. I'm just going to, like I read the verse, now I'm going to explain the verse. I'm going to say, so Garrett, what the Bible is saying here is that when you die, your soul is either going to go to heaven or it's going to go to hell. And the Bible is saying here that if you die and your soul goes to hell, that is the second death. Okay, so that is the death that we deserve for our sin. Okay, so we're trying to get them to understand that Romans 6.23, part A, is talking about them getting this second death, their soul being cast into hell. And many times I'll say, look, we're all going to physically die one day. Even little Jacob here is going to die physically one day. He's always with me, so I use him as examples all the time. But even little Jacob is going to die physically one day. But if we die, the Bible says our, our soul either goes to heaven or hell. And if we die and our soul, go soul goes to hell, the Bible calls that the second death. Okay? That's that spiritual death of our soul that we deserve for our sin. Do you follow me so far? And you want to ask them, like, do you understand that? All right? Now, I will actually give a little bit of an explanation of hell. I'll actually go in a little bit and I'll talk about, you know, look, hell, the Bible teaches that hell is a place of eternal punishment. You know, the Bible says that if you die and your soul goes to hell, you never get out. You suffer and you are tormented forever. It's the most terrible thing you could ever think about. And then I'll, you know, kind of watch their face. I mean, hopefully they're understanding this, you know. So there's additional verses on hell um, that I typically never go to, but I mean, basically the Bible calls hell everlasting destruction, everlasting chains, you know, the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, the Bible says. I mean, if you need additional, uh, you're, you're not going to need additional verses on hell, but if you do, um, good ones are 2 Thessalonians 1, 
verse number 9, talking about everlasting destruction. Um, Revelation 14, 11, which is going to be closer to where you're at in the Bible, talks about you know, the smoke of their torment ascending up forever and ever, having no rest day or night. Just these terrible descriptions of hell. And then Jude 1, 6, of course, calls it, calls hell everlasting chains. Okay, so, you know, there's more than that, but I mean, that should give you um, enough verses right there. So again, that was 2 Thessalonians 1, 9, Revelation 14, 11, and Jude um, 1, 6. So now we can do an example on explaining hell. Um, I typically go to Revelation 21, 8, um, right after this, and I explain that the Bible gives us um, a list, Garrett, of people that are going to go to hell. Let's take a look at this list, and I'll show you how I do that um, now. Over here in Revelation chapter 21, verse number 8, the Bible gives us a list of people who are going to go to hell. All right, let's take a look at this list. All right, look at this list, Garrett. Let's see if, let's see if we're on it, okay? The Bible says, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers, I mean, these are all pretty bad people, like murderers, you know, sorcerers. I mean, I don't think you're a murderer, right, Garrett? All right, well, let's keep reading. And idolaters, and then look what it says, and all liars, uh-oh, shall have their part in the lake with burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So what God is doing here, Garrett, he's listing all these terrible sins. And it says, oh, by the way, all liars. Now, have you ever lied before, Garrett? Yeah. So basically, I mean, everybody has lied, right? That's why God uses that example, because he's basically saying, like, oh, by the way, everybody. Anybody that's even sinned, even one time, you know, deserves to go to hell. All right? So th does this sound like good news to you, Garrett? No. No, it's terrible news, right? Okay. I mean All right, so moving on. Now I usually say, like, I'll transition. I'll say, now, Garrett, we're going to get into where the Bible says something a little bit different from what you told me at the door. All right? Let's go back to Romans. Or Usually I'll read Romans 5.8 right here right for I ask them. Um, sometimes I won't read Romans 5.8, but now is where I would put it in if I do read it, because I ask them, do you think God loves you? And everyone will say yes. And they say, God actually does love you. Look at Romans 5.8, where the Bible says, but God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So now we're introducing this idea that God does love them, and he actually, I'll usually just say commendeth means showed, even though there's a little bit deeper meaning to it than that, um, keeping it simple here. So God showed his love toward us, God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So that introduces a concept of Christ right there. And then I'll go right away to Romans 6.23. Now, Garrett, we're going to get into where the Bible says something a little bit different from what you told me. All right? Romans 6.23. There's three things that we need to understand in Romans 6.23b. Okay, the remaining part of Romans 6.23, there are three things that need to be taught from this. And the first one is this. Read it to them, and you read it. You said, look what the last part of this verse says. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. All right, the first thing that they need to understand is that word gift. And I will usually point right at the Bible, and I say, what does that word say right there? And they say, gift, right? And after you explain, after you read that and you get them to say the word gift, this is where I will give another analogy, all right? I will give another analogy of a gift. Now, you'll notice that when I give the analogy in the example with Garrett, I'm going to use the invitation itself, okay? Why the invitation? A lot of people use different, different objects, okay? I'm going to use the invitation, number one, because they're already holding it in their hand, okay? And number two, it is something of very little monetary value, all right? I have used things like whatever I had on me. I used my sunglasses at some point, you know, as the analogy, and I said, you know, um, Garrett, if I give you this gift, you know, and then tell you, hey, give me $5 for it, you know, um, is that a gift? And they'll say, no, because they'll be like, I'm not going to pay you $5 for this piece of cardboard. I, you know, I hand them, you know, my glasses, and they'll be like, I've had guy, a guy say, yeah, I'll be right back. You know, he's like, looks like a good deal, right? But anyway, the point is, I just use the invite. It's simple. It's there. Um, a lot of people use a pen. They have one in their pocket, whatever. Um, but you need to demonstrate the analogy of a gift. All right, so I will say, Garrett, let's just say I gave you this invitation. You know, let me just give you an example. Let me give you this invitation. I said, hey, Garrett, you can have this. It's a gift. All you have to do is give me $5. And then they'll chuckle. And I'll be like, would it be a gift? What you're trying to do is you're trying to prove works-based um, salvation to them. All right, you're trying to prove what they said and the difference between what the Bible says 
um, about salvation being a gift. And then I'll use another example with the invite, and I'll say, okay, Garrett, how about I gave you this invite? And I said, Garrett, you can have this invite. All you have to do is go wash my car. It's right down the street. And then they'll chuckle, and I'll say, is that a gift? And they'll say, no, because they don't want to wash my car. But I'll say, why isn't it a gift, Garrett? And 80% of the time, they're going to say, because I'm working for it. What, what you really want to ideally hear them say is work or earning it, okay? I'm having to do something for it, all right? Yeah, like you're having to work for it. And if they don't say the word work, I'll repeat the word work to them because you're have to, having to do work for it, right? They're like, yeah, like then it's not a gift. And then I'll just wrap it up and I'll say, if you had to pay me one penny for that invitation, you know, it might be a good deal, but it's not a gift, okay? Because a gift is free. So that's the first thing that they need to understand in Romans 6, 23b, all right? What's the second thing? Continuing to read it. Look, the second thing that they need to understand is the word eternal, okay? Now, the gift of God, Garrett, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see that word eternal right there? How long is eternal? Listen to them. 99% of the time, they're going to tell you forever. I mean, and then I'll, I'll even follow it up because, like, I'm trying to really beat this our eternal and everlasting concept in. So I will bring this up several times throughout the rest of the soul winning presentation. You know, how long is eternal? They'll say forever. It'll be like, when does eternal end? And they'll say, never. Like, it has no end. Okay? And the last thing we need to understand, Garrett, is this gift is eternal life. So the gift that God wants to give you is life that never ends. And it's through this guy, Jesus Christ. Meaning, it's provided by, and I'll use Jacob here again, it's provided by Jesus Christ. Like if I, you know, if I bought my son a bicycle, if I gave Jacob a bicycle, the gift is a bicycle provided by me. This gift is provided by Jesus Christ, and the gift is eternal life. Life that never ends. Okay? So that's the three things that they need, that's the second thing that they need to understand the eternal life and how it just never ends and it lasts forever. The third thing that they need to understand is who provides it. And this is where I explain Jesus, okay? This is where I explain who Jesus is, when he came, and, you know, what he did so we can have this gift of eternal life. And at this point, I'll say, notice how it says provided through this guy, Jesus Christ. And I'll say, so what God did was he became a man 2,000 years ago. And I'll just, I'll, I'll phrase it that way. I don't get into the, the Trinity out um, soul winning either. You know, I mean, it's, that's a, we obviously believe the Trinity, but I just say God became a man in the person of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. Jesus was born of a virgin. You know, the Bible says that when Jesus was on this earth, he did all sorts of miracles. He raised people from the dead. He healed the sick. He made the blind see again. He did all these wonderful things in his life. But the most important thing that Jesus did was when he was 33 years old, the Bible says, he was arrested, he was tortured, he was beaten. The Bible says that when Jesus was arrested and tortured and beaten, he was beaten to the point where you couldn't even tell he was a man anymore. Then, after all of that, Jesus was put on the cross. And when Jesus was on the cross... The Bible says that he bare our sins in his own body. It was like every sin that you'd ever committed in your life, Jake Garrett. It was like Jesus had done it. He was punished for it at that time. And here's the thing about Jesus. The Bible says that we're all sinners, but Jesus, he was innocent. Jesus never sinned one time. We must say that Jesus never sinned because some people believe that Jesus was a man and he wasn't God. Okay, so you have to mention that Jesus was God and that Jesus was perfect, he never sinned, okay, because he was God, all right? Then Jesus died on the cross, he was buried, then after three days and three nights, what happened, Garrett? And most people will know this, and I'll put it back to the guy at the door or the, the gal at the door. It's like after three days and three nights, what happened? And most of the time people will say, he rose again from the dead, he came back from the dead. Exactly. And then I'll say, that is what God did for us, you know, so we don't have to go to hell. And then I'll usually say something along the lines of, now, Garrett, were you born 2,000 years ago? And, of course, that person will say no. 
I'll say, so which of your sins did Jesus pay for? And what you're trying to get them to understand is that since Jesus paid for the sins of the world, since he bare our sins in his own body 2,000 years ago, he bare all our sins in his own body. Because a lot of people think in this, you know, the etch-a-sketch theology that I have to ask for forgiveness, clear my uh, etch-a-sketch, and then, you know, I sin some more, and then I go to church and I clear my etch-a-sketch, you know, shake the etch-a-sketch and, and clear it, everything again. What you're trying to understand is Jesus paid for all your sins, past, present, and future, on the cross. Okay? So, that is the example. And then I will go into Ephesians 2, um, 8. Oh, I will use another analogy here many times. Okay? The another analogy I will use is I will explain Jesus, and I will say, like, that Jesus, the difference between us and Jesus is because Jesus had no sin. Okay? Jesus never sinned one time. You know, that's the difference. That's why God had to do it for us, right? Because God, Jesus didn't deserve it. And whoever I'm with at the time, many times I'll use an example of, um, you know, Brother Jeff is a good friend of mine, all right? Brother Jeff is a good friend of mine, and I believe that if he had to die for me, you know, he might do that. But Jeff can never die for my sins because Brother Jeff has his own sins to pay for. Then I'll say, Garrett, I could never die for your sins because I have my own sins to pay for. This is why God had to do it. This is why God had to become a man, live that perfect life, and be that perfect sacrifice, because when somebody stands in front of that judge for crimes committed, somebody has to pay, and God paid himself in the person of Jesus Christ. Okay? All right? Now, turn to Ephesians chapter 2. And uh, verse, well, not turn to, but now I'll go to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 8. Now, Garrett... We're going to get into the real difference. And many times during Romans 6.23a, I'll start to say, you see how that's a little bit different from what you told me at the door? And I'll say, now, Garrett, here's the real difference between what the Bible says and what you told me at the door. Okay? In Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, the Bible says this. It says, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the what? Well, there's that word again, the gift of God. And then just so we, under, just so we you know, don't forget, look what he says again, just so we understand. Not of works. And I will really point out those three words, okay? Now, I will say, like, that is the difference. Do you see? Now, I'll, I'll explain this verse, all right? By, for by grace are you saved through faith. Now, I'll explain what grace means, all right? Grace is something that we don't deserve. Like, if you, have a, if you rent an apartment or you rent a house and you have a grace period, that means that your rent is due on the 1st, but it's really, they let you pay on the 10th. You know, they give you that nine days period. They don't have to. It's just because they're nice and they're just giving that to you. Okay, it's really due on the 1st, but they let you pay on the 10th. So the Bible is saying that, you know, God gives you this grace that you don't deserve through faith, not of yourselves, not of works. It doesn't say it's a little bit of works. It says it has nothing to do with works, not of works, okay? You see how that's different from what you told me at the door? You know, having to do good things and all these things to get yourself to heaven? Now, this is the part where you may have to go into additional verses if people have questions, because you will have people that believe in works-based salvation that are hung up on this, but more verses can help them, okay? All right, now, additional verses, if you want to write these down. I have a couple that I go to a lot, all right? Um, there's many different verses in the Bible. I'm going to give you four additional verses. Um, but my go-to is Romans 4.4 4, um, and 4.5. Matthew 7 and 21, verse 21 through 23 is for Catholics, okay? So Romans 4.4 4 and 4.5, let's, let's go ahead and, and read those together, read that together. Romans 4.4. 4, in Romans 4, 5, is just showing that literally salvation has nothing to do with works. I love Romans 4, 4 um, and 4, 5 because it's your, Now, this is for somebody who is still, you know, unsure about works being part of it, okay? In Romans 4, 4 and 5, we see two different people, okay? Look at verse number 4. Now, we see a person in verse 4 and a different person in verse 5. The Bible says, Now, to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So the Bible says that this guy worketh, meaning this guy's doing those good works. This guy is like, he's, 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 he, you, you and I would look at him and be like, this is a good person, all right? Because he's doing good works. 
but, but so he's worketh, but the reward is not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So he's not going to get the reward of grace. He's only going to have debt, meaning he's going to come up short. Okay. In verse number five, we see a different guy. Verse number five, but to him that worketh not, this guy doesn't do any works. Okay. This guy doesn't have works. You and I would look at this guy in verse number five and say, that guy's a jerk. He doesn't do works, but look what he does. Believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Okay? So the jerk is going to heaven and the nice guy is going to hell. Right? Because you don't get, to, and I'm not going to give away the answer on believe on or trusting Jesus at this point. I'm just trying to get them to understand that it is not of works. You can't work your way to heaven. You can't get there by being a good person. So I will use the words they gave me at the door, all right, here in a few minutes, all right? But basically, you're trying to get them to understand it's not of works, okay? Matthew 7, in verse number 21 through 23, is very valuable for people that believe anybody that claims the name of Jesus is going to go to heaven, okay? Like, oh, you just believe in Jesus, you know, believe in Jesus existed, and I also believe I have to do works, and I'm going to go to heaven, all right? We can go ahead and read that one. Um, real quickly, if you'd like to look at that. Matthew 7, um, this is uh, one that is very valuable for um, Catholics, okay? Matthew 7, look at verse number 21. The Bible says, not everyone, this is, this is, if you have a red letter Bible, these words are red. The Bible says, Jesus says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Now, he's saying here is not everyone that calls me Lord is going to go to heaven. You know, and see, you have to do the, many Catholics will say, see, you have to do the will of the Father. Then take them to John 640, where it says the will of the Father is that you'd believe on the Son. <laughs> right? That's the will of the Father. Now, let's keep reading. So these people are calling Jesus Lord. He says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? So it's saying there's a lot of people like this. Isn't that true? And in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, verse 23, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So Jesus is going to say to these people, I never knew you. They're, these people are going to hell. Okay, why? Because what were they trusting in? Verse 22, they were trusting in their works. Okay, let's okay. so now they understand. They understand where are they at now? Where are they at? They understand that they're a sinner. They understand that they deserve to go to hell. They understand that getting eternal life is, that eternal life is a gift. Okay, they understand that you don't work for a gift, you don't earn a gift. They understand that it's, it's through faith, that's kind of the answer. But they don't really know, like, how to get it. They know that they can't earn it, but you haven't really given them a clear understanding of how to get it. Okay, and that's where we're going to go next. Now is where we go to John chapter 3, right? If I say, I'm going to say to them, okay, you can't earn it, Garrett, you can't buy it, you can't work for it. The question remains, how do I get it? We want this gift, right? I mean, if you get, and then a lot of times I'll, I'll start to, you know, throw in a concept like, you know, if you get eternal life, Garrett, will you ever get the second death? And they'll say no. You know, so eternal life is the opposite of the spiritual death, the opposite of the second death. All right, now we go to John chapter 3. John chapter 3 is the chapter in the Bible um, about salvation, all right? John chapter 3. First thing you're going to go to is John 3.16. Because even though many people might have had this verse memorized, few people actually understand what it means, which is phenomenal. But anyway, John 3, verse 16. The Bible says, and of course, these are red words again in your Bible. This is Jesus speaking. I like to point that out. I like to point out that this is actually Jesus' words right here. Okay? The Bible says, for God so loved the world. So there's a concept that we've repeated earlier. And I'll say, see, Garrett, God does love you. You know, God does love you that he gave his only begotten son. So there's that gift again. He gave his only begotten son. Who's that? And I'll ask that question. And everybody, if they've been paying attention, will say Jesus. All right? That whosoever, that means anybody, do what? And many times I'll have them read these words right here. Okay? That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. How long is everlasting? All right, so I'll point some things out there and let them talk through that verse with me, pointing out that anybody that does this thing, believeth in him, 
should not perish means you'll never get the second death, but instead you will have everlasting life, which is the same as eternal life. Okay? John 3.36 is the second verse that I will take them to. And I'll tell them, look, look I, could, I could show you a hundred verses that say the same thing in the Bible. I'm going to just show you one more. And John 3.36 is absolutely my, my favorite. Okay? Because it is so simple and explains the instantaneous aspect of salvation. Okay? That's a super powerful verse in the Bible. The Bible says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Explain to them that that word hath is an older word for have, or you currently possess it. So the Bible says that if you believe on the Son, you hath everlasting life. Now, does that say you have to go to church? Does that say you have to be a good person? And now I'll start putting in their words. Remember I said record? I'll start putting in their words. Does that say get baptized? Does that say confess your sins? Does that say pray? No, it says believe on the Son. All right, and now I'll explain what believe on means. This is super important too. They must understand what believe on means. And I'll say, you notice those two words, believe on. The Bible uses those two words over and over and over again. All right, because the Bible says many people believed on him. They believed on Jesus. What that means in Ephesians chapter 1 defines believe on as to trust. Many times if Jacob is standing there, I'll say, I believe Jacob is standing there, but I don't believe on him or trust in him for my salvation. To believe on Jesus means that you have to take all of your trust off other things. Use those words that he said again, whatever they said to you, and put all that trust on Jesus. It's not 10% you and 90% Jesus that is not believing on. It is 100% Jesus and 0% anything else. And the Bible says that if you can do that, that you have everlasting life in a moment. You know, the Bible doesn't say you're getting it over time. It says, he that does this, you have everlasting life. Just like that. Okay? And how long is everlasting? And have them tell you that again. All right? And then you can read the end of the, the part, uh, the end there. It says, he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. All right. So that's a super important verse um, right there. John 3, 36. This is where you can also put in Acts 16, um, verse 30. That's also a very powerful verse in the Bible. And I was, you know, kind of give some context to Acts 16, verse 30. You know, Paul was thrown in prison, you know, and this prison guard, he brought them out, you know, and he, was, he heard Paul and, 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 his, and his friend in prison, and they were praying, and they were just praying to God. And, you know, all of a sudden, this prison guard, he wanted to know, like, you know, where did this hope of theirs come from? And in Acts 16, the Bible says that, you know, he brought them out, this guy brought them out, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And what did they say? They said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. All right? And many times I'll just leave and thy house off because that maybe can confuse people too, but probably not. But the point is, is that it's a very simple verse in the Bible where someone just asks, how do I get saved? And, you know, they say just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't say get baptized. They don't say do all these works or whatever. Um, just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, now um, we're talking about eternal security. All right, this is a super important aspect of a thorough presentation of the gospel. All right, now what I'll do is I'll usually say there's one more thing you need to understand, Garrett, about this gift, all right? This gift, you notice how the Bible says eternal, everlasting, these words keep coming up, and they'll say, of course, because I keep pointing out these words whenever I've seen, we've seen these words come up um, thus far in the presentation, and then I'll go back, I'll go back to the invite example. All right, he's still holding the invite, and I'll say, give me that invite now. And while, while I'm talking, I'll be turning my Bible to Titus chapter 1, okay? While I'm doing this example, I'll be turning my Bible to Titus chapter 1. I'll say, now give me that, give me that gift back, Garrett. What if, now this gift is eternal life, it's everlasting. Now let me just uh, give you another example. What if I gave you this gift, and I said, here you go, Garrett. This is yours, and it's yours forever. And I hand him the invite and he takes it from me, 
and I say, all right, Garrett, you know, what if I came back now next week or two weeks from now or a month from now, and I said, you know what, Garrett, um, and I'll use examples of what I've seen in their house so far or if they've got kids running around or they got a, a dad or a mom there or something, I'll say, you know what, Garrett, I don't like the way you've been treating your family. I don't like the way you've been living your life. And I'll literally just take it back from them. Say, give it back to me. And they'll just be like, they'll go like this, they'll go. And you say, now, was it ever forever if I take it away from you? And they'll say, no. And then I'll say, so what did I do to you, Garrett, when I told you that it was yours forever? And many times they'll just come out right and say, you lied. Or they'll come out and say, well, you took it away, or you, you, know, you, you didn't tell me the truth. And I'm, then I'll say, I'm trying to get them to say the word liar. What I'll say is, what do you call somebody that doesn't tell you the truth? And they'll say, a liar. I'll be like, here's the thing, Garrett. There's only one thing in the Bible, like from cover to cover, and then I'll, I'll use the example again, like there's only one thing in the Bible that God says that he can't do. This is God's perfect word. And imagine God who created the entire universe. He created you. He created me. Imagine God not being able to do something. But God, in Titus, he literally says that there's one thing that he can't do. And the Bible says that right here. It says, in hope of eternal life. And, you know, and I'll say right there, I told you that you could know. This is what the Bible is saying. You can, this is how you can know you have eternal life. All right? In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot what, Garrett? And I'll have them read that word out of the Bible. Okay? God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So Garrett, now I'll just explain eternal security. God, Garrett, what I'm trying to get you to understand is that once you're saved, the Bible says that God will never take away your salvation. That, you know, you're eternally saved. And this is going to be a surprise to some people. Even if they've just changed their mind about works, this idea that right away they're going to start thinking in their head if they're Catholic or, or Protestant of some kind, like, are you telling me that, like, are you kidding me? I can do whatever I want. I can get saved and I can do whatever you want. So what I'm going to do at that point is I'm going to get, um, give them another analogy. And I'm going to give them an analogy that I always use Jacob because he's always standing um, next to me. And I'm going to give them the analogy of being adopted into God's family. Okay? You know, the Bible says, Garrett, when you get saved, you become, um, and I'll usually say, like, you know, the first time somebody told me this, you know, I was like, are you telling me that I can trust on Jesus and then I could just be a drunk and beat my wife and I'll still go to heaven? And, and they'll, a lot of times they'll be like, yeah, exactly. You know, they'll tell you, they'll show you. And the answer actually though, Garrett, is, is yes. You know, once you get saved, God will never take away your salvation. All right, God promises that because God can't lie. So if he says it's eternal life, it's eternal. Okay, and God promises that he'll never take that away. God, you know, John 10, 28 is a good verse if they need an extra verse. God says that he holds our salvation in his hand. Um, you know, he gives us eternal life and, you know, um, no one can pluck them out of my hand, he says in John 10, 28. But this is how it works, Garrett. You know, the Bible says that when you get saved, you become a child of God. God adopts you into his family. Now, Jacob here is my son, okay? Now, God says that when he adopts you as, as a son or a daughter into his family, you know, that he will chastise his children, he says in the book of Hebrews. You know, he'll punish his children on this earth, but he will never take away your salvation. So, Jacob is my son. And if Jacob does bad things, you know, I will chastise him, I will punish him. If Jacob grow, grew up to be a wicked adult, God forbid, you know, maybe I would even kick him out of my house one day. But would he ever stop being my son and then let them answer? And no one will ever say yes. It's, it's never happened to me. No one has ever said yes, he will, he will stop being your son. And, as, and I, then I'll say, that's how it works. That's how salvation works. God will punish us on this earth. You know, I've met drug addicts. I've met drunks. I've met all kinds of, you know, sinners who are in sin that are saved. But they're ruining their lives or they're ruining... They've ruined their lives on this earth. Many times I'll bring up King Saul. I'll show uh, that example in just a few minutes. But that is how we can know that we're going to heaven because God says that once we get saved, once we trust on Jesus, we have everlasting life. He holds our salvation. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1 that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. God seals us 
himself. Okay. The last part is the recap. Okay. So we're going to do the recap. So right now, um, I'm just going to ask this person, you know, so Garrett, do you believe these things? Do you believe the things that I've told you? Do you believe, and I'm going to recap in detail. I'm going to say, you know, because look, we don't want to be praying with people that are not saved. Okay. We don't want to be causing confusion out there and leading people in prayer that are not saved. All right. We don't want that nice person who's just listening to us um, to say some prayer and think they're saved when they're not. Okay. So we're going to recap. We're going to say, Garrett, do you believe these things? Garrett, um, just ask the person, do you believe that you're a sinner? And because of your sin, <coughs> you deserve to go to hell. All right. And this is where many times people will say, no, I don't believe I deserve to go to hell. This is where you kind of find out what they actually believe. All right. Then if they say yes, you're going to say, do you believe that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to take the punishment for your sin? And that if you put your trust on him and him only, God will save you and give you eternal life. Wait for them to answer. So you're going to wait for them to answer all these things. I know we get excited sometimes um, to get people saved, but we don't want to be like, do you believe that, that you deserve to go to hell? Because um, the Bible says you do, right, 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 right. You know, just like you want to like, I get that we want to get people saved, but they must believe it. Okay, so you have to like, this is kind of a test on how well you did explaining the Bible. Let them answer you. All right. Do you believe that if you trusted on Jesus, that God would save you um, in a moment? He would save you right here, right now, and you'd be saved forever. Yes. They, they answer you. And you say, do you believe that no matter what you did in your life, um, after you're saved, that God would never take away your salvation? And then listen for them to answer. And then just say, all right, Garrett, you know, um, after this, the Bible says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For how long? And then they'll tell you eternal, everlasting. So Garrett, what the Bible here is saying is that God, if you believe these things, God just wants you to ask for it. Okay? And we are always going to offer to pray with people here. So that's it. Now, after salvation, um, I will have... Um, a little bit of a, just a conversation with people about, you know, their, their life and, and uh, you know, what comes next um, in their life. I'll just have, you know, I'll just, I'll ask people this question. I'll be like, you know, Garrett, you know, congratulations, you're saved now. Um, how many lives do you have? I'll ask people how many lives they have. They'll say one. I'll say, you know, um, now is where your works come in. Your works, and I'll explain the connection between their works and how profitable to, they are um, to people around them. If they have kids or, you know, people in their house, um, many times I'll ask them, is there anybody else you want to hear this message? You know, and thy house. Many times you will be able to preach the gospel to many other people in their house. Um, so make sure you ask that question. And then ask people just, hey, you know, now is when you need to get into church. You know, now is when you need to get into church. The Bible says you should be baptized now. I mean, you can talk to them about that. The Bible says that you doing what God wants you to do in the words of the Bible is how profitable you will be to other people. You know, your children, you want them to go to heaven, right? You know, talk about, you know, when their children grow up. Now's where your works come in. I'll talk to people if they have little kids and say, you know, if you're living a life of sin, you never go to church and you know nothing about the Bible, but you're saved yourself, what, what are the odds you think your kids are going to listen to you about the Bible you know, when, you know, you open up the Bible to them and they, they'll say, not, you know, because you'll be a hypocrite. They'll laugh in your face, right? So going to heaven has nothing to do with your works, but your works and you living a, a godly Christian life in, in a good relationship with your now heavenly father could mean that, you know, your kids have a better chance to hear the gospel and get saved themselves. And my kids going to heaven is very important to me. So I'll try to like, you know, touch on those things and how important their life is um, going forward. Just kind of trying to make that personal connection. Um, now is where we, you know, you get their email ad address before you leave and tell them we'll send them some sermons and things like that. Um, but mainly, now I don't think we really need to do an example on that, but basically this is where you kind of start that personal connection um, with them, get their information, and then we will follow up um, with them um, from the church. We encourage you to do your own follow-ups. Um, if you can, but my wife and I um, do follow-ups most, uh, most weeks. Um, we're able to do follow-ups as they come in, all right? So 
That is that, all right? So just have a, a, a small talk with them about their life going forward, um, congratulate them, and that's it.